creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint, let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be at church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing, even so come, Lord Jesus come. Even so come, Lord Jesus come. There will be justice, all will be new, your name forever, faithful and true. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for a groom, we'll be at church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait, we wait your coming. So we wait, so we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait, God, we wait, your coming soon. Like a bride waiting for a groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for a Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. So we wait, we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait, we wait, your coming soon. So we wait, so we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait, God, we wait your coming soon. Like a bride waiting for the groom, we'll be a church ready for you every heart. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. While we wait, we worship. It's not just a passive waiting. It's an active waiting where we worship the Lord, where we serve the Lord, where we are busy with doing the things that God wants us to do, but all the while waiting, waiting for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to return. So this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome, welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us in worship today. Welcome our guests and our visitors and attenders and longtime members. Oh, it is good to be here today to worship the Lord together. Wouldn't you say amen to that? Amen. 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 Well, I invite you to stand in body or spirit to hear the call to worship 
from Psalm 145. These calls to worship, these are the reasons why we praise the Lord, why we give thanks to God, why we worship the Lord. Psalm 145 says, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. The Lord is, is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. We have some little babies here with us today, some children. We have adults. We have uh, young people. We have people with gray hair. God's grace, God's faithfulness extends through all generations. So let us worship God together as we sing, Let Your Kingdom Come. See the Lord. 
seated on the throne, exalted in the train of his throne, fills a temple with glory, and the whole earth is filled, and the whole earth is filled. And the whole earth is filled with his glory. Holy, 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 holy is the God is the God who greets you this morning. 
receive God's great gift. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, I'd like to invite the children to come up front for a special message. My box here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Any more children coming? Oh, come on. Hey, we've got a couple spots right here for you. Come on over here. Good morning. Good morning. I like your polka dots. Can you guess what's in this box? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, sorry, am I too loud? Hey, guys, come on down. You're right. This is a box full, full of candy. Can you, you can smell it. Ooh, see that? A box full of candy. Do you guys like candy? Yeah. Me too, I like candy. This box is leftover candy from the vacation Bible school we had. And it sits in my office. And every day when I go into my office, which is right back there, I have to walk past this box full of candy. Now, what would happen? What do you think would happen if I ate all the candy in this box at one time. If I just got in there and just ate the whole box of candy, what do you think would happen? I would get a stomach ache. I would probably get very sick. I don't know, maybe even have to go to the hospital. If I ate this whole box of candy at one time, that would not be a good idea, right? When it comes to candy, I need self-control. You see, self-control is what helps us not eat the whole box of candy, but just have one or maybe two pieces. And self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. See, God loves us so much. He loves us so much that he gave us the Holy Spirit so we could have self-control so we wouldn't make ourselves sick. Isn't that wonderful? That God, he knows that sometimes we want to eat the whole box of candy. But he gave us his spirit so we can have that self-control to not eat the whole box, but maybe just have one or two pieces, and that's enough. Now, I like to share my candy, but I also like to respect parents. So, if you, after the worship service, if you get permission from your parents, come and see me. And I'll let you get a piece of candy, okay? But you got to ask your parents first after the service. All right? Well, let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much. We thank you not only for candy and, and delicious things that you uh, give us in this life, but we thank you for self-control so that we can enjoy those things without making ourselves sick. So we thank you for loving us. We thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ and the gift of the Spirit pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can head back to your seats. And remember, after the service, if you get permission, come see me. You'll get a piece of candy. All right? Yeah. 
The sermon text today comes to us from Galatians chapter 5, wrapping up our series on the fruit of the Spirit. So I thought it would be appropriate for us to look at the passage where the fruit of the Spirit are found. Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Praise God for his word. Well, today we come to the last fruit of the Spirit on the list, self-control. Oh, I've already alluded to my problems with self-control. I must admit, this is the most challenging fruit of the Spirit for me. Not that I've got the other ones down pat, but self-control. In fact, as I worked on this sermon, I had the overwhelming sense that God was having me write this sermon just for me. So you all get to listen, but God was saying, yeah, you need to be paying attention to this. I had a friend who was a chaplain in the U.S. Army, and I noticed that whenever we ate together, he wouldn't finish all the food on his plate. He, he would leave just, just some of the food left on his plate. In other words, he wasn't a member of the Clean Plate Club. Anybody else uh, grow up being members of, you know, my mom, whenever I finished all my food, she'd go, oh, good job. You're a member of the Clean Plate Club? Well, he was not a member of the Clean, clean Plate Club. And one time I asked him about it. I, I said, I noticed, why, why don't you just finish all your food? And he said that he did that to show himself, as a discipline, he did that, to show himself that he was in control of the food on his plate. And the food on his plate wasn't in control of him. 
unlike these dogs. Now, if you're not a dog owner or if you haven't spent time around dogs much, I apologize to you because this probably won't be as funny. But if you own a dog or have ever been a dog owner or been around dogs, you're going to get this. So here uh, in this first panel, you see that their master has obviously made himself a peanut butter sandwich, and he's putting the peanut butter away. And, and this dog says, get this. He could eat that whole jar of peanut butter. Oops, sorry about that. But he doesn't. And they're just looking at him. And this one even puts his paw up on his arm and says, What's wrong with you? You see, dogs, they don't understand self control. Thankfully, we aren't dogs, we are human beings made in God's image. We don't have to eat the whole jar of peanut butter or eat the whole bag of Twizzlers or that whole package of Oreos or that whole cheesecake. Filled with the Spirit, we can have self-control. A couple of weeks ago, we thought about running the race and one must have self-control in order to run the race. As the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Now in the Greek, the Greek word that's translated strict training in this verse is from the same Greek word that is translated self-control in the fruit of the Spirit. So strict training, self-control, they're from the same Greek word. Just like an athlete needs self-control to stay physically fit, we Christians need self-control to stay spiritually fit. And self-control is all about denying yourself. That's why this fruit of the Spirit is such a challenge to me. Because I don't want to deny myself. I, I want to eat what I want to eat, when I want to eat it, how much I want to eat. But self-control is all about denying yourself. And denying yourself is a big part of following Jesus. As Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. That is, practice self-control and take up their cross and follow me. Unlike those dogs in the cartoon, the Holy Spirit enables us to put the lid back on the peanut butter jar. Self-control enables us to be fully human, not act like animals. According to Paul, the Galatian Christians were acting like a bunch of animals. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 15, Paul warns them, if you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by one another. In other words, stop acting like a bunch of animals and, and show some self-control. Obviously, there were some problems in the Galatian church. And they weren't getting along. Self-control is one of those fruits of the Spirit that enable us to get along with one another. As Paul wraps up chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. That's what was going on in the Galatian church. So Paul writes to them, and in between these two verses where he tells them to stop acting like animals, to stop provoking and envying each other, Paul contrasts the acts of the flesh. Notice that. It's the acts of the flesh. Those are things we do. The acts of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is what God does. And he points them to what God does as a way of restoring harmony to their fellowship. As he wrote, in Galatians 5.13, you, my brothers and sisters, 
we're called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another in love. Now, earlier in the letter, Paul explained to them that they were no longer under the law, but instead Christ had set them free from the law through faith and by the power of his love. So we're free in Christ. We're free in Christ, but we are not free to do whatever we want. Like eat that whole box of candy. We need to have self-control. I heard one pastor put it this way. True freedom, true freedom, is not being able to do what we want to do. True freedom is being able to do what we ought to do. Not being able to do whatever we want to do. True freedom is being able to do what we ought to do. And what we ought to do is serve one another humbly in love. Jesus Christ set us free to be able to do that, not to eat a whole box of candy. But we have a problem, and it's called the flesh. We've all got it. Every one of us in this room has got that same problem. The flesh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. When I was in seminary, I took a course called Basic Christian Ethics, where we studied the Ten Commandments. And, and I always remember what the professor said on the first day of class, even before the whole class started. He said, the problem isn't that we don't know what to do. That's not the problem. We know what to do. The Bible gives us very clear instructions of how we are to live. The problem isn't that we don't know what to do. The problem is that we don't want to do it. That's the real problem. Instead, we want to feed the flesh. Now, when Paul talks about the flesh, he means our, our sinful nature, that which opposes God. He's talking about that rebel, that rebel within us that, that just somehow wants to do its own thing instead of surrender to God. See, even though we're free in Christ, we still have this the sinful nature that we have to fight against and keep it in check. That's the flesh. Our spirits have been born again through faith in Jesus Christ, but not our bodies. These bodies that we're in are not born again like our spirits. And as long as we're in these bodies, we will struggle with the flesh, with the, the sinful nature. It's going to be a lifelong struggle. Do you know when we will actually stop sinning? When we die. It's true. That's when we'll actually stop sinning, as the question is asked in Lord's Day 16 of the Heidelberg Catechism, one of the great teaching tools of the Christian faith. Since Christ has died for us, why do we still have to die? The answer, our death does not pay the debt of our sins. Rather, it puts an end to our sinning and is our entrance into eternal life. I've always thought, wouldn't that be something at a funeral? If the pastor, in talking about the person who might be laying in the casket, well, at least they stopped sinning. Have you ever heard a pastor say that? <laughs> I've never said that. I've thought it, but I've never said it. <laughs> and the good news is, one day we will be raised to new life in bodies that won't struggle with sin. They will be glorified bodies suited for life in God's new creation. So we got that going for us. But until then, we struggle with the flesh. That's why the fruit of self-control is so important. Without self-control, we end up becoming slaves to the things that we crave. Without self-control, we aren't able to put that jar, that, excuse me, that lid back on the peanut butter jar. Now, self-control may sound limiting. 
right? That just sounds like self-control. Don't put no controls on me. I'm free. Self-control, it sounds limiting, but actually, it's liberating. It's liberating because it gives us the freedom to enjoy things like food and drink and candy in moderation and not be consumed by them. God gives us the spirit of self-control so we can keep the flesh in check so we are free to enjoy God's creation and free to serve one another in love. That's why God wants us to have self-control to free us up so we're not slaves to the things of this life. Good things too, food, candy, drink, that can be good things. But if we become obsessed with them, desire them too much, then they're not a good thing. And it's possible, it is possible to have the fruit of self-control as long as we're walking by the Spirit. As Paul wrote, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now to walk by the Spirit means to let the Spirit lead you, to do the things the Spirit wants you to do, and not the things that you want to do. Notice how this works. Paul didn't write, walk by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh as though it's two commands. That's not not how it reads. He wrote, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The one flows out of the other. The only way to not gratify the desires of the flesh, to not live like that, is to walk by the Spirit. To walk by the Spirit means to allow the Spirit to control you and not your appetites or your ungodly desires. So instead of giving into hatred and the desire for revenge, those who walk by the Spirit love their enemies. That's how, we get, that's how we avoid giving into hatred and, and seeking revenge is because we love our enemies. Instead of being jealous of others because they have something that you don't have, instead of being jealous, those who walk by the Spirit rejoice with those who rejoice. How do I keep from getting jealous? I rejoice with you when good things happen to you. I rejoice with you when you have good things even though I don't. In fact, I get to experience the rejoicing when I rejoice with you, walking by the Spirit. Instead of stepping on people in the name of selfish ambition, trying to climb that corporate ladder, those who walk by the Spirit are gentle and considerate of others. Instead of clicking on that website, it's going to cause you to lust. Those who walk by the Spirit turn it off and walk away. Instead of overeating, those who walk by the Spirit are able to eat moderately as they find their comfort in the Lord, not in food. Instead of getting drunk, those who walk by the Spirit do what it takes to stay sober. It isn't easy walking by the Spirit. It's so much easier just to give in to the flesh. It isn't easy to walk by the Spirit because the flesh and the Spirit are always at odds, always in conflict with one another. I heard about a man who described the conflict this way. He said, inside of me, there are two dogs. One of the dogs is mean and evil. The other dog is good. And these two dogs, are always fighting. And when asked which dog wins, he replied, the one I feed the most. You see, when we give into the flesh, when we gratify those sinful desires, that dog gets stronger, maybe even leading us into an addiction. But we can't let that dog win the fight. Because as Paul writes, those who live to gratify the desires of the flesh will 
not inherit the kingdom of God. That's how important it is. How important it is to walk by the Spirit so we don't gratify the desires of the flesh. Now let me make something extremely clear. I don't want anyone to misunderstand me on this point. Paul is not talking about the times that we do sin and regret it. He's not talking about that. We all sin. And praise God, there is forgiveness in Jesus' name. Paul isn't talking about our struggle with sin. As I mentioned, that's going to continue until the day we die. Paul is talking about people who continue to sin with no remorse, no desire to change, no attempt to change. They just do whatever they want in order to satisfy their cravings. And those people will not inherit the kingdom of God because they show by their lives that they don't belong to the kingdom of God. Those who belong to the kingdom of God, they may still sin, but they struggle to overcome it because they want to change. They want to live a godly life. If you're struggling with a particular sin, maybe even one of the acts of the flesh that Paul lists in Galatians chapter 5, that's actually a good thing. What? Did the pastor just say that sin is a good thing? No, that's not what he said. It's not a good thing that you're sinning. That's not a good thing. The good thing is that you're struggling. Because that struggle, that struggle is a sign that the Holy Spirit is living in you, convicting you of that sin so that you will repent. The really bad thing would be is if you didn't have any struggle with it. If you were just continuing gratifying the flesh with no desire to change whatsoever. That would be the really bad thing. As Pastor John Piper once said, the sign of whether you are indwelt by the Spirit is not that you have no bad desires, but that you are at war with them. That's the sign that you have the Holy Spirit, that you're at war with those bad desires. And the only way to win that war is to walk by the Spirit. Jesus Christ walked by the Spirit. So when the devil came to him and tempted him, to change those stones in the, into bread to satisfy his own hunger, Jesus had the self-control to say, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That was self-control. Jesus Christ won the war against the flesh a long time ago when he was crucified and died on the cross. And listen to this. By faith in him, by faith in Jesus Christ, we too have been crucified. Which means that we too have died in a spiritual sense. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, for we know that our old self, that's the self ruled by the flesh, was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Even though we still struggle with sin, the fact is that in Christ, because we are united to Christ, by faith, in the power of the Holy Spirit, that in Christ we are dead to sin. Sin has no power over us because we are united to Christ and Christ has set us free from sin. As we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. You see, what happens is if you struggle with a particular sin, Satan will say, ah, 
What are you trying to do? What are you trying to change? Oh, you know what a sinner you are. You know how bad you want this. And, and just tries to throw the past back up in your face all the time. But you can say, Satan, get away from me because in Christ I am a new creation. The old has gone. The new is here. Not that the new creation will come. Notice this. The new creation has come. In order to walk by the Spirit, you need to know who you are in Christ. In Christ, we are set free from the old self, the one ruled by the flesh, so that, so that we can live into the new self, the new creation. Theologically, we call that sanctification. And it's a lifelong process. Sanctification, becoming more Christ-like in our actions and our attitudes. Oh, that's a lifetime process right there. Which means we have to be patient with ourselves and with others. That's because we can't make the fruit grow. We can't make the fruit grow any more than a gardener can make grapes grow. The gardener can't go out there and yell at those grapes, come on, hurry up, grow, ripen. Oh, that's in God's hands. That doesn't mean the gardener doesn't do anything. See, the gardener creates a hospitable environment for those grapes to grow by, by taking care of the soil, by weeding, by watering, by pruning, by keeping the, the varmints away from eating those grapes. And in the same way, we can create a hospitable environment in which the fruit of the Spirit grows in the garden of our lives. We may have some weeding to do. Maybe some things we got to weed out of our lives, getting rid of those things that hinder the fruit from growing. Or maybe we need to do some watering. Maybe we, we need to add the, the water of God's word into our lives to help the fruit of the Spirit grow. Or, or maybe the plants aren't getting enough sunlight. And, and we might need to shift some things around in order to maximize exposure to the sun. Not S-U-N, but sun S-O-N, the Son of God. The, the best way, the best way to facilitate the growth of the fruit of the Spirit in your life is to spend time with Jesus. If you're having a hard time walking by the Spirit, if you seem to be sucked into that gratifying the flesh, then I would suggest to you that it's probably because you're not spending enough time with Jesus in prayer, in worship, in his word, in, in serving others humbly in love. As Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But if we remain in Jesus, spending time with Jesus, it's inevitable. The fruit of the Spirit will grow in our lives. That's because God is the master gardener. And because we belong to Him, He is going to make sure that we bear fruit. After all, He gave us the Holy Spirit to make it happen. As the question is asked in Lord's Day 1, the Heidelberg Catechism. What is your only comfort in life and in death? Is it candy? Is it Twizzlers? Oh, that's candy too. Why am I thinking about candy so much? Get that box away from me. Is it food? Is food your greatest comfort? Is it sex? Is it money? Is it pleasure? What is your greatest comfort? What is the thing you turn to? for comfort in your life. The Heidelberg Catechism teaches us, 
What is your only comfort in life and in death? Here's the answer. And if you're struggling with the flesh, you should memorize this, this answer and recite it to yourself every day. I only comfort that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. And because we live for Jesus, walking by the Spirit, one day, one day we will inherit the kingdom of God. God help us to be fruitful Christians. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you. Oh, thank you, Lord, for forgiveness for all the times that we do give in to satisfying those cravings of the flesh. Thank you that you forgive us for all the times that we don't exhibit the fruit of self-control. Lord, we ask you to Help us walk by the Spirit. Lord, and may that all the fruits, may all the fruit of the Spirit grow in our lives so that we can glorify you and humbly serve one another in love. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I've mentioned before in the series, we can't, or I said today, we can't make the fruit of the Spirit grow. But what we can do is we can surrender our lives to God. We can surrender our lives to Jesus and ask him to cause that fruit to grow by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I invite you to stand in body or spirit as we offer God our hearts today. Make this your prayer. Every breath.
breath that I take every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me. And the God who loves you the God who wants what's best for you is the God who blesses you. So receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So I won't be ashamed. 